this inaugural conference on improving the energy efficiency of Irish buildings, and I invite Minister Ryan to give the opening paper on his vision for the future of retrofitting in Ireland. Thank you. Thank you, Brendan, and good morning, everyone. Um, I'm a child of the 70s, and I, I have that memory of kids on our road siphoning petrol out of cars or pushing cars up to petrol stations. Um, and it's hardwired into us, I think, we, 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 that that dependence on oil is something that wasn't clever. And we forgot about it in the 80s. We got mid-80s onwards, we, we kind of stopped investing in switching away from oil. Um, but it's there in our psyche. Anyone who's old enough to remember that time would remember that that can come back. We also, it's hardwired in my psyche that, the, that we have to act on climate change. We have a moral duty to try and stop this planet going over some of the tipping points that our best scientists cite. And that gives us a second greater, in many ways, reason to cut out those fossil fuels. When you look at it, from, I was away outside the country the last week, I was over in the States. When you look at Ireland, we are not well placed. We're one of the most fossil fuel dependent countries in the world. Ten pints of oil a day for every man, woman and child is what we consume. Um, 11 tons of carbon each, which is quite high by international standards. So we're starting from a place that's not ideal. But I want to give you maybe just a sense of hope or sense of what I see, how we are actually starting to change. And in do so, we're actually starting to do it quite well, that we're showing that we can actually adopt to this agenda and we can actually be good at it. I want to very briefly talk on electricity and transport before going into the heating area, heating being the most important, the most immediate area where we, where we can change. But in all three areas of energy use, we're starting to go in a different direction. It suits us, and it works. In transport, or in power generation, take that first, we're up to about 15% of our electricity coming from renewable supplies, from primarily wind. We know now because of the good work, that's the sort of uh, modelling work that's been done in Airgrid and in ESB, that we can get to 40% at the end of this decade, as long as we build the grid. That will make us the highest uh, wind power country in the world. You know, we're already going to about to, the next couple of years we'll overtake Denmark. They have the advantage that they can ship power into Norway, can ship power into Germany, but we're going to be probably the leading country in the world for deployment of wind power. And by the necessity of um, uh, the invention we'll get from that will actually be, make us a centre for some of the software and other technologies uh, that will come out of that. There's an economic opportunity for us in that area. There's also an opportunity for us to actually start exporting power, a bigger plan, a really big long-term plan that myself and Brendan Halligan and others have been talking about about actually shipping power from Ireland to the rest of Europe. So there's possibilities there. We need, I was talking to Duncan Stewart on the way in here, we need to develop microgeneration so that people as well as anything else support the development of the grid, that they see it as their grid. And we're only starting. We have work to do, but we can do it, and we're showing that actually we're starting to deliver. In transport... Again, we're starting to change. In 2007, the, Irish, the average Irish car, new car, was emitting 164 grams for every kilometre. In 2010, the average Irish car is emitting 135 grams per kilometre. So we've improved the efficiency of the new fleet 20, some 20% in three years, partly because of the recession, but primarily because of just an intelligent tax change that makes it cheaper to do the right thing. We will build the metro, employing 4,000 people to do so, and the east-west interconnector, because we need to start electrifying our transport system. I need to start building buildings along those lines. 
The metro isn't just a line to the airport, it's a line to every point in between and beyond to Swords, where we do have a lot of development land, where we do need to get our construction industry back working again. We will not shut down our construction industry for the next 10 years. It will start and turn around within the next five years, and we want to build it along lines where the carbon is cut out. We run the Lewis every morning, let's say as a commuter, you're using about 75 kilos of carbon a year. Driving a standard SUV, you'd be using about 2,500 kilos. And the quality of the experience in the Lewis or on the Metro when it comes will be significantly improved. In electric vehicles, a similar way in which we can electrify and cut out the carbon in our, in our transport system, we are well placed. I was over in Washington at the last three days at a smart grid conference looking at this very issue. And the realization came to me over there and talking to the top people in this area in the world that actually we're probably the leading country in the world now in the deployment of electric vehicles. We're going to be the first to have a national network. We've got all the leading car companies coming here. We're, this is the first country that's going to really try this and make it happen. And the benefit from that and the opportunity from that is we develop all the software solutions that are going to be needed to make it work. So we developed the charging infrastructure, the billing system, the battery, the communication systems that will tell you where the next charging point is. Um, or we also develop the home energy management systems that starts to integrate your car and your home. And we'll have the opportunity and the advantage in doing that because we're going to be one of the first countries in the world that are actually doing it and have here not only our own expertise and our own resource, we're starting to see coming here now the likes of the IBM decision to actually set their Smarter Sissies initiative in Dublin. Their top researchers, their expertise, their core business in this area is coming here because they see there is that opportunity here to develop solutions that you then apply elsewhere. On a very, just thinking very big scale, just thinking, step back and thinking what we have to do here, it is retrofitting our cities for transport, for energy, for water. And actually, we're not the only ones, Brendan. There was a systemic failure across other countries in the west of the world as well, in America and Europe. They have the exact same task ahead of them, one that we know we're going to have to do this century. So if we develop a model here in cities like Dublin or Cork or Galway or Limerick, which are very similar to cities that are exist in the States and in Europe elsewhere, other people can, can then apply those solutions in other countries. And it is an integration of the transport, the heating, and water is what we're, need to, we're going to need to get right. As we put in a smart meter, energy meter to the home, we will also put in a water meter. And the communication system that will bring that information back and allow us to use that information will be the same single system. And as I said, we can start to use the car plugged in outside in the driveway as part of the home energy management system as well as the person's transport system. But first and foremost, we need to actually make those homes fit for purpose. If you look at how, if you're planning to cut out fossil fuels, if you're looking at how you're, if you're planning to cut out carbon, and you look at the, what they call the McKinsey cost abatement curve, what's the cheapest things you do first? It jumps out, it's absolute obvious, it doesn't require huge economic analysis that actually it's retrofitting buildings with better insulation, better lighting management systems, better heating management systems, boiling, boiler systems, is what you have to do first. It's the best economic return ahead of any of the other investments that we're going to have to need to make. Um, I started thinking about this about seven or eight years ago as to how we'd actually do it. I was on the Oireachtas Committee uh, on Communications, Energy and Natural Resources and started talking to people from other parliaments in terms of what's happening in other countries. Started talking to the Danish parliament about what sort of schemes they had in place. And started to thinking of designing, okay, how would we actually help make it happen? When we came into government three years ago, I think we, had, we were looking to implement this as one of our core achievements in government. We were able to get a commitment for 100 million euros over five years in, the first in, the, in, in our program for government. The reality is three years in that this year we'll spend 100 million in that area, not over five years, but just in one year. It's taken us three years to trial various different systems. And this was always going to be a learning by doing and adapting and evolving. 
So what we've seen is a number of different schemes in place, some already there, the Greener Homes Scheme supporting solar water thermal, geothermal and other heating systems. The Warmer Homes Scheme, there in small volumes when we came into government, but something that we've ramped up massively because recognising that fuel poverty and protecting those in lowest incomes as fuel prices spiked, as oil prices went up to $150 a barrel, was an urgent priority. But critically, the Home Energy Savings Scheme, which we introduced, we did first on a trial basis, which makes sense. Test things out, first of all, get them right, and then deploy them nationally. So we went down to Tipperary, down to uh, Limerick, and a number of other locations around the country, and started this Home Energy Savings Scheme, uh, where we were looking to retrofit insulation, attic insulation, cavity wall, exterior insulation, new boiler systems, new switching systems. And two years on, it's starting to work. We'll go into the just under 40,000 homes this year. Um, and we've surveyed homes we've already gone into, a very major survey. I think the details will be coming out later on today. And what's it saying? 98% of those surveyed said they'd recommend what they'd done to their neighbor. 98%. And these were average, ordinary homes. The, the typical household in income of these homes was about 50,000 euros, very close to the national home average. So these are ordinary Irish people across this country have had this done and said, yep, we are about 90% approval of the contractor's work, as I understand from the survey. The details come out later. So we've done something that actually works. But now we want to go further. Now we want to continue to adapt and evolve these schemes so that they really work and so that we get a number of different changes to them. I want to outline just the three senses of where we want to go now, how we want to evolve this to make it work better. Firstly, we need deeper solutions. In the Home Energy Savings Scheme and in the Warmer Home Scheme, we're finding that householders are taking on some elements of it. They're typically doing attic insulation. They may go on to do cavity block or interior dry lining insulation, but... We wanted householders to go further to do the entire package. To re if we're going to go into a house, let's go in and do it as broad a job as possible. It's more economic that way. It's a more comfortable experience coming out of it. So we're looking to see how do we get a deeper um, project done, a wider amount of work, larger, rather than maybe an average 3,000 euro job, how do we make it a 10,000 or a 15,000 euro job because that makes more economic sense. One of the ways, crucially, that we have to do that is to find a new financing mechanism because the reluctance or the difficulty around that is how do I get the 10 grand or how do I get the 15 grand? And I think, crucially, as our new retro scheme evolves, it will be the sort of pay-as-you-save model where the upfront capital cost is met not just by a grant from the state or support from the state, but also from a financing mechanism that allows the capital cost to be paid up front and the savings that are done from the job pay off the interest on that over the subsequent three, five, seven, or ten years. So critically what we're looking for is for the finance companies to step up to the mark here and provide that sort of capital financing arrangements where the uh, savings on, from the work done pay off the bill over five or ten years. People can do it on their mortgage by extending their mortgage. Others may do it in a term loan. But we critically need financing solutions that make it easy for the householder to do that, that the bill savings pay for the capital cost. And that's one of the big changes we're looking to evolve and develop and get right as we expand from 50,000 houses to the million, next million houses we want to do. Second change we're looking to see is maybe just that this isn't always just government-led, top-down, grant-led men men mentality. One of the most fundamental changes we need um, as we go to retrofit our houses for water, for energy, and for transport is that the utility and energy companies that provide services to those houses do not see their measure of success or do not see their profits determined by how much power they sell into the house, but rather the services that they provide at least power consumption. In order to switch the whole utility thinking and modeling from actually how many kilowatt hours can I, or how many kilowatt hours of energy, or how much oil can I sell into that house, to how can I provide that house with heating and lighting and other services by using least amount of energy? And whichever utility or energy company does that best 
is the one that's going to hold the customer's hand. It's the one that's going to succeed. It's a complete switch in utility thinking is what we need. And we're driving in that direction with this new retrofit scheme by putting an obligation on the utilities to make those energy savings. So say your success is measured by selling less. It's not an easy change to make. It's not an easy conceptual, conceptual switch. But that's what we're looking to do. And we have the advantage in that our main utilities in ESB, in Bordgash, in Airtricity, and I believe in our other energy companies, actually get it. They're actually ahead of the pack when I look and talk to other utilities across the world in the States last week. We're way ahead of the game in understanding that that's the new dynamic, that's the new paradigm that utility and energy companies have to live within. And there's good models. There are other countries doing this as well. You know, there are obligation schemes along the lines of the ones that we are introducing that have been tried in the UK and in the US and elsewhere. So we're not flying alone on this one, but we are actually determined, because we have this public obligation, being one of the countries most exposed in fossil fuel dependency, to make the switch. And we want our utility and energy companies to actually make it happen. Thirdly, in terms of just how we're evolving this and how we're going to make this really work and really hum and really big. I remember I met that seven or eight years ago a woman, Anna Greta Hansgaard, from the Danish parliament, and she'd done a lot of thinking on this. She was very good. Unfortunately, she's been in opposition for the last seven years, so she hasn't had a chance to implement some of it. But she, I brought her into the Oireachtas Committee. I sat her down with my Labour and Fine Gael colleagues seven years ago. I said, listen to this woman. This is where we need to go. And one of the things, just simple messages she had is, why is it that people are spending 20 grand on a fitted kitchen? You know, the full wraparound, granite this, Italian marble, the other, stainless steel, Japanese uh, sushi knives hanging down, bronze kettle pots, everything. People spend 20 grand on that without blinking. They actually go into a sales room, it takes them three minutes. I'll have kitchen number B, please, Tuscany red or whatever. And it comes in in one fitted solution. The reason why people spend that money, A, because it is made easy, but crucially because there's a status attached to it. You bring your friends into dinner and you kind of look at my lovely kitchen. And we've always had a fundamental difficulty in this whole energy retrofitting businesses. You can't see it. You, by definition, you can't see it. So how do we get status into this? And the crucial way for us to do it is to use the building energy rating system which we now have. It's taken time to get right, to have it really working, but we have that. Fair play to the Kevin and the others in SEAI who've done it. But from now on, anything we're doing, let's do it on a tested before and after measure in terms of what did you start off with the building energy rating and what are you finishing up with, so that there is a before and after show test. And when it comes to status, I believe... The, reg the legislation and regulations we're going to put in so that if you advertise your house, you have the rating on the ad. And I don't think Irish people are going to want to be selling their house with an E-. minus. I think they're going to have a huge incentive and a huge imperative towards, let's, can I get up to a C1 or can I get up to a B1? Because that's not only just status, and it's, it's a very measurable status, it's also cash. It also improves the value of your property. So whatever about the flow stream in terms of lower bills, the prospect that in 10, 20 years' time when I'm selling my house as a B1 rather than a D1, I'm going to get that value back is one that's very real and I think can catch into the Irish imagination given our seeming obsession on property. So that's the third measure we're looking to evolve and develop here in this insulation, in this retrofit scheme. Um, and we're going to have to continue to evolve it. This is let's learn by doing and actually get it right. And then when we get it right, let's really expand it out and go beyond the 5,000 jobs we're supporting at the present time into 10,000. Get our construction industry working again by using this retrofit program. I would like to commend Brian Motherway and Owen Lewis in particular in SCAI who have real expertise in this area. I think they've been joined very capably by St. John O'Connor and the other officials in my own department who I think have done, done good work in putting some of the um, systems in place. But this is work in progress. We're going to have to continue to adapt, evolve, get it right, get it better. And once we have it really working, massive scale of ambition. You know, really ramp it up 
so particularly in public buildings as well as housing where we have an obligation to make the sort of energy cuts we need to make. Uh, as I said, I was away in the States in the last, I was at this smart grid conference in Washington. We were invited. The reason we were invited is because actually we have stuff to tell these people. The meeting with Secretary of State Chu yesterday. And when he's, he, I was saying to him, we're going to go to 40% electricity from wind. He kind of, he said, he, he wanted to see the algorithms. He's a nuclear physicist. Um, when I said to him that we were, what we were doing on the retrofit side, he said, you mean you have a building energy rating system that will tell each house what the value? I said, yeah. He said, well, it's a public opposition to it. We're terrified of, oh, he didn't say we're terrified. We feared that there'd be certain difficulty getting that in. I said, no, we've done it. On electric vehicles, we're number one. So we have real skills. We have real capability. We are doing it. And the Irish people buy into it. It's a tough time politically at the present time. It's not easy. But one thing I know is that the Irish public get this and are doing it and are comfortable with it. So let's really push it. Critically to do that, we need political consensus. This is not a Green Party initiative alone. This belongs to every political party. This is not ideological. This is not left versus right. This is just common sense. We need to slightly get away from a political system that's just uh, caught in a point scoring basis to one that's actually give real uncertainty to the likes of the people in this room. Yet this is going to happen because this makes sense. This is good economics. Uh, and I'm going to my colleagues in government and in opposition arguing for that. Let's give certainty here, let's give real direction, and let's have common ambition, which is massive in scale. I've been helped tremendously in that regard by the likes of Brendan Halligan, a former senator, a former MEP, a former TD, the only person actually I think who shares that or has that triple achievement. Uh, and I think, Brendan, you've shown great leadership, and I appreciate it, over the last three years. But we're only at the beginning. This is the birth of something that is, as he says, going to be massive, that makes sense for, this pe for our people and our country, and I hope for everyone in this room. Thank you.